held a rally near our home, and drove through our neighborhood with a billboard claiming I abused women. A threatening package containing white powder was sent to our home. Interestingly enough, the media chose not to report on that incident, though they reported the claims against me in minute detail. All the while, I was focused on the whirlwind of activity that surrounds a cabinet nomination. I had no idea about the extent of the vetting process nominees undergo. It is intense, exhilarating, and good preparation for posts subject to regular congressional oversight. I worked daily with the Trump transition team to prepare for confirmation hearings before the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, known in Washington slang as the HELP Committee. I was meeting with the individual senators on the committee as well as their top staffers, giving them a sense of my positions and getting to feel them out before I formally appeared in front of them. And I was getting ready for the job thinking about potential nominees for the sub-cabinet posts, and planning how to implement the Labor Department's piece of the President's agenda for job creation. But by early February, the attack campaign reached such a fever pitch, and the attacks leveled against me were such a constant presence in the mainstream media, that some Republican senators were beginning to get nervous. Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, had only just barely been confirmed, and the press was gleefully reporting that the new Trump administration was incapable of putting together a functioning cabinet. Senators were swamped with emails and phone calls in opposition to the DeVos confirmation, as well as left-wing attacks at town hall meetings. If the barrage kept up, my own party could sink my nomination before I even got the chance to make my case in a hearing. Vice President Mike Pence had been working with Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to count the votes and see where I stood. The Vice President and I trusted each other and knew we could count on each other to be straight and to the point, even if we weren't saying what the other wanted to hear. Now the vice president was calling with the results of his final conversation with McConnell. His words would determine whether I continued to gear up to face the help committee hearing or begin to pack my bags for home. I pressed accept. Hello, Mr. Vice President. I first met Donald Trump in May 2016 at the home of Tom Barrack one of Trump's longtime friends and major supporters, who later served as chairman of his presidential inaugural committee. Since the previous December, I had been having informal discussions on economic policy with members of Trump's economic policy team. I also had similar discussions with staffers from the Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, Carly Fiorina, Marco Rubio, and Scott Walker campaigns. I knew personally and had spoken and met with many of the front-running candidates. Though I have been a conservative since the 1980s, I voted for George McGovern on my first trip to the ballot box, I am not by nature a political person. I had some involvement in the political process and often shared my views on economic policy, but by and large, the business of politics never appealed to me. I preferred the business of business. My particular business was restaurants, quick service specifically. I was a lawyer by training, and I fell into the fast food world in the mid-1980s when I met Carl N. Karcher. Karcher had grown a small Los Angeles hot dog stand into the successful Carl's Jr. restaurant chain and was the head of its parent company, CKE Restaurants. In 1991, I became Karcher's personal attorney and moved to California. In 1997, I became CKE's executive vice president and general counsel. I stayed with the company through its highs and lows for the next 20 years, becoming CEO in 2000. With a lot of hard work, we took CKE from near bankruptcy to become a fast food powerhouse with 3,800 locations.